Hey, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Evan. Uh, my company is called Point3 Security, uh, and we help organizations identify, cultivate, and measure their cybersecurity talent. Um, I want to thank the uh, AFID-C organizers for inviting me to speak, um, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to share what at least I find to be a pretty fascinating topic. Um, recently, there have been, there's been increased uh, energy and attention devoted to gamified ecosystems, uh, particularly how they help solve challenges related to recruiting, retention, training, uh, talent benchmarking, uh, and other aspects of workforce development. And I'd like to use the next half hour or so to share with you some of the research uh, and attention in the field. Uh, the talk is entitled Ready Player One, How Gamified Ecosystems Will Save Us All. Uh, feel free to interrupt, feel free to heckle, I'm, I'm pretty flexible. Okay, so I don't believe that I'm super naive, right? I've if anyone's not familiar with the Gartner Hype Cycle, you should really familiarize yourselves with it. It's, it's a pretty fascinating uh, mental, mental trick. Uh, so like, I've seen us wander into the peak of inflated expectations where I think a lot of people are placing gamified ecosystems right now. And I know what likely comes next is the trough of disillusionment where everyone just turns against the technology, right? Blockchain and AI were just super in vogue just a few short years ago, and now everyone thinks it's not going to do, neither of those technologies are useful at all. Eventually that'll write itself, right? And I am seeing just past that slope of enlightenment and well into the plateau of productivity. Because if you're gonna take away any one thing from today's talk, just know that gamified ecosystems are not a fad. They increase your team's productivity levels in ways that translate to enterprise level metrics. I'm talking about recruiting, retention, job satisfaction, employee confidence, response times, and close rates, all measures of productivity. And gamified ecosystems are already excelling here in the productivity world where results matter both to your mission and to your organizational culture. And some important research studies that we will review today corroborate that marketing hype. So, question. How are we taught? In the US today, and in much of the world, we can thank Queen Victoria, mashing a global empire with a seasonal farm and mercantile-based economy sprinkled in with a little industrial revolution. It's efficient, with rows and rows of empty chairs in the front, uh, with rows and rows of students, uh, each being told the same information on the same schedule. One teacher can cover the needs of dozens of students. And thanks to technology, the Victorian model can now put one teacher in front of hundreds of students in large lecture halls, and you can even stream content online over webcast to thousands. Think about the cost savings to the schoolhouses. However, it's not effective. As we all know, information is crammed and then forgotten as soon as that multiple choice test is over. The curriculum either teaches to the lowest common denominator, slowing down your top performers, or those who fail to keep up, wash out, either forever, thus wasting time, tuition, and a seat, or in the case of a retake, must start all the way back to chapter one, when the course starts up again, even if the student passed through those early chapters, he or she still has to start at chapter one. It's all or nothing. So, different question from how are we taught. How do we learn? Since the dawn of time, we have gained skills via apprenticeship, by a master craftsman imparting knowledge to an apprentice, the young Padawan engaged in an authentic experience on the path towards becoming that Jedi, and it's very effective. Historically, though, it has not been very efficient. Anyone that could not land a limited slot with that blacksmith or tailor didn't have much in terms of job prospects. Recently, however, there has been new study into this, and if we can define a model for apprenticeship, perhaps there are ways to adapt it to the modern workforce. So Vanessa Paz Denon from Florida State authored a paper defining the critical aspects of cognitive apprenticeship into six areas. In summary, distills basically into an experience of watch me do it, now copy me, now do something close but not identical, now let's talk about it. And this process is repeated until mistakes aren't made and the student surpasses the sensei. So allow me to take a quick three slide interlude to explain how I got immersed in the world of gamified learning. So my company, Point3, was brought into the Pentagon a few years ago to help them with something they called the Cyber Operations Academy course, or COAC. The purpose of the COAC was to offer a schoolhouse using this cognitive apprenticeship model instead of the Victorian style schoolhouse currently in production for uh, the cyber workforce uh, today. 
So to facilitate this, we built a learning management ecosystem to track student progress and provide access to a cyber range housing very, very carefully constructed, authentic, and modern hands-on challenges in a variety of topics. Reverse engineering, vulnerability research, network forensics, host-based countermeasures, instant response, automation, et cetera, et cetera, right? The skills, essentially, that are required to be relevant in today's cybersecurity workforce. All right, so the content on this slide is lifted from a talk at this year's Mod Sim World given by Dr. Shane Gallagher. Uh, and Dr. Gallagher's talk was titled, Games, the Solution to Build the Cyber Operations Workforce. Um, Mod Sim Conference, that's Modeling and Simulation Conference, is for real nerdy data science types. Uh, full disclosure, I am not a data scientist, um, but when I look at these graphs, uh, clearly something is happening. So, how do we explain this? The Institute for Defense Analyses, Booz Allen Hamilton, and the Advanced Distributed Learning Initiative observed this COAC course. And these charts are in a unit of measurement called Cohen's D. That's a zero to two based scale on mathematical derivatives from data at specific intervals. Essentially, it's used to measure learning. On the left, you see a before and after of our students' ability to perform applied skills on practical hands-on assessments. Now, some of those assessments were 0.3, so there is some bias in what you're seeing on the left. But many of the benchmarks were not. We utilized Carnegie Mellon's Cyber Stakes Live and Pico, Ares Security's Capture the Packet, <coughs> Sir Cadence's Project Ares, the Department of Energy's Cyber Fire, and the industry's OSCP certification as independent benchmarks of learning. A normal college course produces a 0.5 change in Cohen's D, and an effective college course produces a 0.8 change. COAC students, on average, experience gains of 1.31 Cohen's D. And on the right, you see those who have gone through a cognitive apprenticeship style of learning compared against their Victorian style counterparts. So three years later, we have 75 students that have gone through this program. We're looking at north of 90% mission affiliated placement within the community. Our former students have retained what they have learned they use what they learn in their professions and they're outperforming peers that have not experienced a cognitive apprenticeship. Co-ec related personnel have gone on to win or placed in national capture flags to include Raytheon's Game of Cones, SANS' Net Wars, DEF CON, the Cyber A3, to name a few. And so here's the cool part. If you think about classic apprentices, those blacksmiths, those tailors, the journeyman to apprentice ratio was like one to one, maybe one to a few. We have 75 alumni. So how did we scale something that historically has not been efficient? Formalized education theory, the study of learning models, not really my jam. I used to work in the intelligence community as a computer network operator. So it turns out, like, we by accident push the students through a gamified learning environment. And I had not heard of such a thing. It turns out these are all rage in academic circles these days. So what makes a game? On the screen is the definition of a game, defined by two MIT researchers in a paper called Rules of Play, Design Fundamentals. If you parse the definition, you end up with four key aspects of a game. Features, mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics. Features evoke a particular gameplay, right? This is your raw emotion. Anything that contributes to problem-solving ability or to executive functions. Mechanics are how you motivate and invoke engagements. So examples include player feedback, goals, badges, leveling, competing, community, points. Dynamics pertain to that autodidactic behavior, the drive to complete on one's own, whether the game is solo, competitive, or collaborative in nature. And aesthetics is that sense of immersion, the degree to which one becomes part of the simulated world. And it turns out that games work. This image was lifted from a paper written by Simone Kuhn, with the coolest title ever. Uh, it was called Playing Super Mario Induces Structural Brain Plasticity. Whew. So if you check out the fMRI on the screen, what the image shows you is that one's gray matter volume is affected by gameplay. So I'll say that again, right? Your brain literally physically changes composition in areas related to spatial navigation, strategic planning, working memory, and motor performance. And games have a persistent effect on what researchers are now calling fluid intelligence, a non-IQ form of measuring potential. That is, the ability to analyze novel problems, identify patterns and relationships, and perform inductive and deductive logical reasoning processes. 
This problem-solving ability, increased by gameplay, is of prime interest to cybersecurity employers. Employers such as the U.S. Department of Defense. So the Journal of Cybersecurity and Information Systems recently published an article called Learning Cyber Operations Through Gaming, an overview of current and up-and-coming gamified learning environments. And they profiled four gamified learning environments in use by the military today. Full disclosure, Point Three's Escalate platform is one of the four profiled. While as a small business owner, I totally appreciate the exposure. That's, that's not why I cite it here. Like, this really is a key document. It was authored by those responsible for readiness and preparedness for the military. And the article cites evolving strategies on how to build a pipeline of talent. The DOD has to experiment with many approaches. And the article has just candidness about the sense of immediacy of addressing the problem. The current style of Victorian model learning in schoolhouses, it's, just, it's simply not working. That Victorian style takes longer to produce qualified personnel and is more costly. So reading explicitly out of the journal article, quote, gamified learning environments are powerful tools for engaged and motivated learning experiences. They can be an essential component of the strategic and comprehensive cybersecurity training strategy, which is a national imperative. And these environments will help produce qualified personnel to meet the demand signal. And this gets to that point where we have this like skills gap that we keep hearing about, right? Recruiting and upskilling, assessing and retaining. These are big issues with the military, right? The military doesn't often get like Harvard grads and it's certainly not over generous salaries, but the military must staff cybersecurity positions and do so with individuals capable of becoming experts in a very short amount of time. And one of the best ways that has been identified to ensure this is via gamified learning. And industry players agree as well. They have the same challenges, talent identification, cultivation, measurement, retention. At the RSA conference last year, Grant Borsicus, then the CISO of McAfee, led a series of workshops and presentations around a commission study about gamification solutions. Polling managers and technicians only from organizations with 500 employees or more, we have some data, and this is fairly significant. Small companies are traditionally leading edge, right? Like, large companies and organizations take a while to change. So the study's only limited to those large firms that are typically not agile leaders with response to policy shifts. So what do those large companies say? One, there is a clear and strong correlation between gaming and cybersecurity activities. Gamers and incident responders and SOC analysts, it all overlaps. They all continuously look for clues, develop perseverance, Work logically, based on observation, they hunt threats. Those polls cite the mix of gaming and automation as directly reducing threat detection times. 57% report that games increase awareness and knowledge of how breaches occur. You cannot be a defender if you don't know how the bad guys are breaking in. And 77% of senior managers agree that their organization would be safer if their organizations leveraged more gamification. 77% of managers. Two, there's a clear correlation between gaming and retention. Respondents say gamification enforces a teamwork culture. Respondents who are extremely satisfied with their jobs work for organizations that run games or competitions throughout the year multiple times. And satisfied employees are more productive. The study cites 11 hours for happy employees to identify a breach, while dissatisfied employees take 23 hours to identify similar breaches. And a lot, as you know, can happen in a 12-hour difference. And three, there's a clear correlation between gaming and recruitment. Three quarters of senior managers of large firms consider hiring a gamer even if that person has no cybersecurity experience. Again, you can train the technical aspects using internal workforce development programs, but it's harder to train passion and drive. So, at those companies who utilize gaming solutions, you're seeing happier employees the time to ID threats decreases, turnover decreases, and employees are more likely to say positive things about their employer. And the small and mid-sized business market is getting involved too. The next few slides are derived from a LinkedIn work product uh, based on a 4,000 person interview. So executives are tremendously afraid of the looming skills gap. As many in this room know, you study new hotness and like boom, it's old and busted just a few weeks later. So there's limited utility in investing in a specific training on a singular technology. Rather, the number one concern cited is soft skills, problem solving, organizing, collaborating. 
those indirect elements one gets from a gamified approach to talent cultivation, the number one concern. The second core message from polled executives is to meet your employees where they already are. And we see this all the time. We talk to prospects and it's the technicians who tell us about the big training systems that the senior execs bought that can teach you everything from Python to cooking to a foreign language. Currency training, right? But no one uses any of that because nobody wants to use it. It's not interactive. It's a bunch of videos. It's CBT, which has a terrible stigma. And we hear that videos in the browser are not as compelling as in our industry, pulling down old capture the flag images offline and going home to Tinker. So it's nice to see some realization from management and that boardroom that gamified learning is the way that, you know, the direction the company should take. And ROI, the study asked executives, what would be the measure of success of a training program? And the top three responses, one, talent retention. And this is unsurprising. One of the greatest costs to any organization is in recruiting, onboarding, and ramping up personnel. Smart leaders will do whatever they can to reduce turnover. Two, an increase in productivity, right? And this is also fairly unsurprising. You measure productivity before the training, you measure productivity after the training, if the gains outweigh the cost, and there's your ROI, right? Check out success measure number three, employee feedback. So is the training applicable? Is it compelling? Would you do this if you weren't forced to do it from management? That's a measurement of culture, right? Are employees part of the career progression conversation? And done right, this can be very powerful. And that's backed up in the same study, which also polled employees, not just employers. 94% of employees say they would stay in their organization longer if it invested in their career development. That is an incredibly high response rate. Your employees want to be loyal and productive. They want this to be a two-way street. So consider the next question. Anyone in the audience have any thoughts as to how most employees would respond to that question? What would lead you to spend more time learning? Anyone? Fun. What's that? It being fun. Fun, okay. Anyone else? Why would you spend time learning? Passion. Passion. Cool, I like it, and now I'm stuck because somebody always in the audience screams money, and none of you did, so now I'm gonna read <laughs> a script. <laughs> a script. So it's not money, right? A lot of times, I've done a speech a couple of times, and often I'll do the training if, if it's gonna give me a payball, right? That's not a thing, right? So less than half of the respondents cited incentives or promotions as the reason to endure training. The number one reason cited was it was part of the organization's culture to learn and grow and progress. People want to feel valued. They want to interact with their learning environments and not simply consume boilerplate mandatory videos and take compulsory mandatory cho uh, multiple choice tests. So what does gamified cybersecurity look like for you and your organization? How can you get involved? Broadly speaking, I believe there are currently five viable market offerings for gamified solutions. Really, you need to do some soul searching uh, as to whether you want your gamification strategy open to the community or limited to key internal stakeholders. This largely depends on how you budget for this. Is it training, human resources, recruiting, marketing? There are many ways to implement a gamified strategy that suits your needs and budget. So the first is bug bounties, right? These can be internal or external, fairly simple in concept. You invite people to break your product. If they succeed, you serve them with a prize and not with a cease and desist. And products can be proprietary tech, uh, a custom web app, a mobile app, what have you. Uh, some are by invite only to key employees, some are broad appeals to a global community of researchers, and some are in the middle. Uh, we partner with a really cool company called Synac. Um, I know they've done stuff like Hack the Pentagon and some other military-based exercises. Crowdsource this, right? Have a global pool of talent that can look at your products for you and help you out. Hackathons are also internal or community-facing. You give participants some resources, commodity hardware, maybe a license to your thing for a day or the weekend. You state a general problem. Teams work to solve the problem and prizes can be awarded based on novelty, feasibility, or commercial viability. Essentially what you're doing here is leveraging the gig economy and you're really only paying people for their success. And so, a little bit, you know, iffy, but right, like, it has benefits for all participants, not just those winning participants, right? Particularly as employers start steering their human resources departments to focus on skills over knowledge, we've seen hackathon participants receive job offers just for playing at best, and at minimum, just a resume boost. Um, 
Capture the flag. So we've hosted these intra-company, red team versus blue team, east coast versus west coast, what have you. Uh, we've done them as community-driven events. You know, Battle of Montgomery or my school cyber club is better than your school cyber club, right? They're really good for social engagement. This is a pure community building play. You can ID talent before you recruit. You can do a post-event debrief on winning strategies and broad benchmarking. Capture the flags matter. They matter to the hosts and they matter to the participants. Continuous learning environments is the fourth viable option. Uh, so this, in my opinion, uh, is the biggest growth area. Employers hate paying for certifications, right? Your employee is gone for a week or two weeks doing nothing for you. They come back with a cert and they go looking for a new employer, right? There are smarter ways to engage your employees and nurture their individual and career growth. Companies can, can, can tailor continuous learning environments to create incentives for their employee, for employees. We have one customer right now using uh, a gamified ecosystem for job titling, right? Pass these X challenges and your title is junior. Solve these Y more and now you're a senior. If you solve Z, you're a master operator, right? Prizes are awarded at each level, right? We've seen companies pull employees out of help desk or out of finance and into cybersecurity roles. So a gamified ecosystem works well for all stakeholders. Employees gain skills and grow, which makes everyone happy and productive. And the last market offering is tabletop exercise, right? These are often internal only func uh, functions, usually with very limited participation. Your senior level execs, maybe a manager or two from your IT or cybersecurity shops. The goal of the tabletop is to see how your company responds to stress conditions. Uh, it's scenario driven, right? How would we respond to ransomware or if our comms go down or if some proprietary database is out on a pastebin site? They're run like a fire drill. Don't panic. We have a three ring binder with our contact for our PR firm, our data backup solution, you know, our, our lawyer, if, if applicable, like we've got this, right? That's the purpose of a tabletop. So interlude number two. IBM coined the term new collar in an op-ed probably uh, somewhere between five and 10 years ago. They went on a huge media blitz and have since authored a series of fascinating white papers specific to cybersecurity and IT in general. And in short, as many of you know, there is a purported skills gap. Hundreds of thousands of vacant jobs, and the problem is only expected to get worse. Uh, the uh, nonprofit ISC Squared organization claims the problem can be as many as three million unfilled jobs in the coming years. And in my view, there appears to be a huge disconnect between what companies need how human resources recruits that talent, and how academia prepares that talent. New Collar fills jobs where academia is not supplying the talent as is. IBM did a huge breakdown comparing professionals who have college degrees, professionals who have technical certs, and professionals who don't have either. Anyone want to take a guess about the correlation? It's weak, it doesn't exist. Shocking, I know, but it is possible to perform technical work without certifications or without degrees. It's possible to be productive to employers without certifications and degrees. It's possible to have a work ethic and be able to participate as a team player without certifications and without degrees. And IBM now claims that 20% of its cybersecurity personnel hired in the last few years fall under new collar. That is, they entered those positions via non-traditional hiring strategies, they were tapped for their interest, and then upskilled internally. For IBM, cybersecurity shop demonstrates that talent trumps the ink on one's resume. And so, I have one final question. Why is there a skills gap? Why can't organizations identify, cultivate, measure, and retain cybersecurity talent? I believe the answer is that there is not a skills gap. There's a gap in hiring and placement practices. With gamified ecosystems, we are seeing the following. One, you already have talent within your personnel gene pool. You simply need help identifying the key attributes of likely performers so you can reassign them into cyber roles where they can learn the technical aspects and tradecraft and thrive for you on mission. Two, or you can leverage the gig economy via bug bounties and hackathons. Engage the community, only pay for results. It's pretty compelling, right? We're seeing traction here, again, with Hack the Pentagon and other offerings uh, that are similar in nature. Or three, and probably most importantly, your team may be completely overlooking entire populations of incredible talent, simply because those individuals do not possess technical certifications. 
I was at the NSA as an operator for several years. I was a team lead. I didn't have any technical certs. It wasn't a discriminator for me then, and I don't understand why it's become a discriminator now. In all cases, a gamified ecosystem is able to help your organization attain the readiness levels for your critical missions. And that is why gamified ecosystems will save us all. Thank you. So all of the talks that I mentioned are up on the screen. I see some people taking pictures of slides. Now is probably a good time if you're interested in the sciencey aspect. Um, and if not, you can just get in contact with me and I'm happy to get you a copy of this briefing. I see some cameras up, cameras, boom, boom, boom. Yay, two more. Slow people, three, come on. You just gotta push the button once, good. <laughs> Yay. All right. Um, and then this is my contact information. So I tried to make the font large enough, but if you can't see it, just um, come say hi after the briefing. So we got some time. Uh, anyone have any questions? Very cool. Yes, sir. Um, do you know if the uh, DOD is already um, planning on moving to more gamified environments for training or anything along those lines? So I, I can't speak on behalf of the DOD. Uh, so the question is, um, do I know if DOD is um, moving towards a gamified approach? Um, I can't speak on behalf of the DOD. As a business owner um, and one of a small handful of, of gamified providers, I mean, our business is, is increasing, particularly with, with the DOD. So I'm personally seeing a trend higher. Um, I know our other folks in the community, in the gamified ecosystem community, are also seeing the same kind of trends. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, it sounds too similar to the agile airing concept of moving forward and moving and coming to the basics, the basic training uh, set of cyber when you get to your units, they're going to shoot to a training, with a training kind of platform and they're going to see where we start to shine and we're interested in and actually the same thing as infrastructure to the base and get to be better as a cyber operator. Yeah, so uh, roughly we're talking about like pipeline management, uh, how do we shape individuals into specific uh, roles. So like the way that our company got involved again was, you know, the Pentagon says like, hey, point three, like we're training all these people, we're sending them to like mission operational units and those people aren't necessarily producing what's going on. And we're like, well, what are you doing? You're like, well, we sent them to certified ethical hacker boot camp, security plus boot camp, CISSP boot camp, A plus boot camp, tech plus boot camp. And, they got all the things, they should be experts now. Why can't they do things on computers? I was like, well, I don't know, I don't hold any of those certs, but I'll tell you, if you give me six months with somebody, instead of sending them to multiple choice tests over and over again, just let me have your folks do no emails, no meetings, no taskers, no PT, which is positive and negative, right? But, uh, but let me give them an authentic, just jungle gym for hackers, right? Let's break into a couple computers, even if you've never done that, we can roll for that. And it's going to take time because I'm not going to teach you the answer. You're going to teach yourself, and that takes time. You're going to be frustrated, and you're going to think you've gotten nowhere, and you're going to have an aha moment, come back over the weekend, and figure it out, and move forwards. We're going to work in teams. We're not going to have tests. Um, and again, we have that team-based, hands-on learning. This the data show like it's more effective than learning from a book or from watching a video or from attending a talk. Uh, and so. Um, it helps, right? We were able to reassign a couple of individuals. Uh, one uh, from the Air Force who was a cable doc. He pulled Cat 5 through drywall at Ford operating bases, and now he's reverse engineering malware. Like, that's a better fit for him. It's a better, bit, better fit for the nation. So you can identify that kind of talent when individuals self-identify by putting in the time. And it, it, it's a gym, right? Like That's what all these solutions are. It's, it's a gym, right? Everybody wants muscles. They all want the beach bodies but then they expect you to like, spoon feed them the answers, and it doesn't work, like you have to invest in yourself and do those push-ups over and over and over again, and you hate it while you're doing it until you look in the mirror. Gamified learning is no different. You hate it while you're doing it because you feel like you're not getting ahead, and then you solve something, and you feel really good, and you never forget that. You remember your first exploit, right? I wrote that shell code, like I did the thing, like I didn't have to cheat, I didn't have to copy, like, it's way more effective when the experience is pure. And I think that's why you're seeing a trend into gamified learning. Yes, sir. So, two questions. One is the the crux of your talk talks a little bit more about um, creative ways to, to train people to a level or to a skill. 
I'm wondering if you have experience with or you're familiar with research that deals with more like metacognition, you know, education and learning. Um, so I'll let you deal with that. Also. Okay, so the first question is, uh, I'm probably not going to summarize this right, but um, what is my familiarity with metacognitivity and other ways of looking at learning? Okay, so I can very possibly say I know nothing about that. Um, Dr. Gallagher, who I referenced in the talk, um, he is all about that. Uh, about, you know, did you get the right answer? Did you know before you hit the submit button that the answer was going to be correct? How confident were you? Are you guessing? Are you sure? Like that kind of stuff. Um, he would be a fantastic contact for you for, for that kind of stuff. I don't know anything about that. I'm just a, um, keep my working. second question is say hypothetically you work for an organization that's responsible for the online education of every Air Force officer. Okay. And you like are going, thinking yeah. very critically about how to incorporate gamification into capstone level events at Captain Major, Lieutenant Colonel level mm -hmm. learning. Where do you begin? Okay, so the question is how can you leverage a gamified ecosystem to create internal classes of seniority? Is that relatively? No, it's way more, I guess, at, at different levels of learning or different units kind of. Seasons of, of leadership. Even. Um, how, do you, how do you even begin to think about gamifying like a, a capstone educational experience? Yeah, so it, it, it's hard to do a capstone if you don't know what the learning objectives were for the, the thing that led up to the capstone. Um, I'll say like one of the strategies that we as Point Three use in our ecosystem is the the user experience is nonlinear. So um, anyone, it, it, I always akin it to Netflix. Like you log in, sometimes you're in the mood for like horror or romantic comedy. Sometimes you want to do like now reverse engineering and network forensics, you know, whatever. Um, since any individual can choose his or her, her, her own learning pathway, what that does is, as like a mission commander, you can have your junior people go do junior level stuff, your senior level people go do senior level stuff, your officers go do officer level stuff, or whatever, you know, your warrants do warrant stuff. Um, and then from a managerial perspective, you can see and track who's doing what, how is that individual progressing, and how does that individual or uh, team unit benchmark against other team units that have gone through similar experiences. Um, so it, it, the way that I would do it, um, like we map everything against the NIST NICE 2.0 framework, and so what I would do is I would try to figure out like what, what does success look like for your particular program, and then let's work backwards and figure out what are the challenges that it takes to get someone there, and then again, how does, how does that team compare against uh, similar individuals under similar uh, situations? Thanks. Uh, any other questions? All right. Uh, have a great afternoon. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it.